When Paul couldn't visit a church to deal with a crisis, he would write a letter to deal with it. But towards the uh, later stages of his ministry, he couldn't visit churches because he was in prison. And the majority of the letters we have were written while he was at least under house arrest, if not in a prison cell. So he just couldn't go and sort out a crisis. He had to write letters. And the next letters we're going to look at were all written either during his first arrest in Rome, when he was under house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier, but able to live in a rented house of his own and receive uh, visitors. And then later, the letters to Timothy and Titus were written when he was in a prison cell in the condemned cell, awaiting certain execution. So most of the letters we have were written in prison. Such a lot of good Christian writings have come out of prison. Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress would be an outstanding example. So we're now going to look at uh, some of the letters called prison epistles, written during that first imprisonment when he was under house arrest. I told you earlier, I'm just going to run through some of the things I said to you in a previous study, that he wrote three kinds of letters, personal to individuals, occasional to a local crisis situation in a church, and general letters or encyclical letters which were for general circulation, not dealing with particular problems. And we have three letters, all written at the same time and sent with the same postman, a man called Tychicus, to the same area. The first is the letter to Philemon, which was the first little letter he wrote about a runaway slave, but we'll be studying that later. And then he wrote to Colossians, a crisis in the church at Colossae, and then he wrote a general letter which we call Ephesians, but which actually didn't have an original address. The word Ephesus is not in there in the earliest manuscripts, so it was clearly a general letter which ultimately came to rest at the city of Ephesus. So we have the three occasions, and I said that especially with the second type of letter, which we're going to look at now, Colossians, you have to read between the lines and try and read the circumstances, the situation, the crisis and the need that had arisen. We ask, what does he correspond to? Or who does he correspond with? Or why does he correspond at all? Correspondence corresponds to a situation at the other end. And we've always got to ask about what the correspondence is. That's simply the pattern of letters, which he always used, which is the formal pattern used in the Greek world, the name of the sender, the address of the receiver, greeting, compliment, the substance of the letter, a summary, a closing greeting and the signature. And with all biblical epistles, therefore, we have to, first of all, make it real by going back into the situation, trying to find out what was happening there, look at the actual practice of the church, but then we have to make it relevant to today by bringing it forward and applying the principle to where we are at. So we've got quite a lot of work to do when we read a letter of Paul. Well, now let's just look at the geography of it. We are now looking at the western part of Turkey. In fact, I'm going to start with this one first. Almost all Paul's letters are on that map. The letter to the Galatians, the letter to Colossae and to Philemon, the letter to the Ephesians, the letter to the Corinthians, the letter to Rome is just off the map, the letter to Thessalonians, the Philippians, most of Paul's letters can be found around that Aegean Sea, but the area we're going to look at now in more detail is the western part of Turkey, which was then the Roman province of Asia here. And uh, there's a kind of circular route here, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Does that strike a chord? Uh, those are the seven letters of the book of Revelation. A postman could take them around the road here. But we're concerned now with this area here. There was a valley here with three towns in it, Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. And it's that little area plus Ephesus that we're going to look at now. Paul is now away in Rome under house arrest, but he's writing letters to this little area here, and in particular, this valley like to show you a picture. It's a beautiful valley, but the name of the river running through it is very significant. Here's the valley, here's Colossae, and it's a very beautiful valley surrounded by hills, but the river that runs through it is called the River Meander. 
meander. Have you ever heard that name before? It's a river that goes all over the place, and from it we've got the word meander, a meandering river. And we're going to see that Colossae was the meandering church. And so often something that happens in uh, a church is because of the district in which it is. The background of it has got inside the church. And this is a church that was beginning to meander and wander away from the truth. And it's quite common for a church to begin to meander. Well, that's just given you the setting of it. And we now look at the place Colossae. Paul wrote the first, the letter to Philemon about the runaway slave, and he sent Onesimus, the slave, back to his master in Colossae, or rather it was Laodicea, I think, where uh, Philemon was. But he also at that time wanted to write a letter to the church at Colossae, so he sent that as well, and he sent Ephesians as well. So all three letters were sent at the same time through the same postman to the same area. Well now, let's look at Colossae. What kind of a place was it? You can see it's on a major route through Asia. This road down to Arabia was a very important road. And one result of being on such a major east-west artery is that you get a very mixed population. All sorts of people settle there, travelers from all over. So you have a very, what we call a cosmopolitan city in Colossae. You had the original people who were called Phrygians. You had many Greeks. You had many Jews. You had many Romans. Later, the Saracens made this a Saracen town, but it's always been an international town. And therefore, and this is more significant, it was a town with many different religions. Many, many religions. It's what we now call a pluralist town. Have you heard that word? It's becoming very common. Pluralist means you get different religions in the same street. And that is now happening in England to a degree as never before. You can find some streets in Birmingham where you'll find Sikhs, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Christians, Jews, all in the same street. And that presents, of course, many relational problems. How are we to live in peace with so many different religions competing with one another? And the pluralist uh, situation is a very different situation where you're dealing with just one large pagan religion. Ephesus was very much more one pagan religion. Diana of the Ephesians, the goddess Artemis, was the main religion in Ephesus. But Colossae, everything was there at Colossae. Let me just run through. There was a lot of animism. Animism is where you believe in elemental powers in nature a spirit controlling the river, a spirit in the tree, a spirit in the mountain. Now, I would have thought that would not trouble our modern thinking, but I tell you, under the Green Movement, it's coming right back in. The fertility cult, the worship of Mother Nature, and it's interesting that when you worship the Earth, that's always feminist, because the Earth is always feminine. And Mother Nature, and Mother Earth. Well, there was a lot of animism, of sheer primitive, worshipping nature spirits. And there was a very unusual natural feature. It's not on that photograph that I showed you, but away over on the hill, there's a whole hillside that's white. Uh, they give it the nickname the Cotton Castle. And in a number of travel brochures, I've seen pictures of it recently, of people swimming and sunbathing on this white mountain. It's just covered with salt deposits from springs, and it's quite a sight. You, you'll see it in your tourist brochures now. People go there to bathe in the hot, salty water and sunbathe on the white cliffs. Uh, it's called Cotton Castle. Um, spa waters. So there were plenty of unusual natural features around for them to worship. Then there was the astrology was very strong. It had come along the road from Persia, from the east, and uh, astrology was one of the problems they had to deal with in the church in Colossae. And that's right back, you know, six out of ten men and seven out of ten women in our country read their horoscope every day. And as uh, Shakespeare put it, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in your stars, it's in ourselves, but they still read this stuff. So animism, astrology had come along the road from this way, the Greek and the Roman pantheon were there, all the gods and goddesses of Greece and Rome were all in Colossae in Colossae. Mystery religions, as they're called, from the East had come. 
They are often described as Gnostic religions, G-N-O-S-T-I-C. That's the opposite of agnostic. Agnostic is someone who doesn't know. Agnostic is somebody who says, I do know. And they had lots of secrets and initiation rites, and the mystery religions were there. Judaism was there. But the Judaism of Colossae, being quite a long way from the Holy Land, had taken on a different kind of tone, and as Judaism often does. If ever you've listened to Rabbi Lionel Blue on the radio, then he is very typical of what happens to Judaism when it gets away from its roots and becomes more philosophical. It becomes less moral and more mystical and is not the heart of real Judaism. And it's, it's very compelling and very interesting for people and very dangerous stuff. It's neither Judaism nor Christianity. And then there was Christianity. It had not come to Colossae from Paul. Paul had never been to that place. Don't even know that he passed through. How the church at Colossae came about was this. When Paul was in Ephesus, one of his converts was a man called Epaphras. And Epaphras said, I want to take this gospel to my hometown. And Paul said, where do you come from? He said, Colossae. Then Paul said, go and preach the gospel in Colossae. And it was Epaphras, one of Paul's converts at Ephesus, who had started the church at Colossae. So that's important. Paul is writing to a church he has never founded and never visited. And that's why he has such a large number of greetings in it, because he's trying to establish contact. When you write to a stranger, you say, we have a mutual acquaintance in so-and-so. And so Paul mentions Epaphras. He mentions Aristarchus, who also comes from there. He mentions Demas and a number of others whom they knew, whom he knew. But the report had come to him from Epaphras that things were going badly in the church. And Epaphras wasn't himself uh, officially an apostle. He just preached the gospel and got a few neighbors together. But now the church was running into problems. And Epaphras had told Paul what was happening. And Paul said, well, I'll write a letter to them. But remember that he's writing to a church really over which he has no authority because he didn't start them and he's never, they don't know him. So his tone is fairly cool and gentle all the way through. He certainly doesn't talk as we heard him talking to Corinth. You wouldn't do that to complete strangers. You can only speak like that when you've got a relationship with people. So it's a different kind of letter. Well, now, what's the problem? What's going wrong? And here, Bible scholars and students have argued endlessly about what was happening. Certainly, wrong teaching had come in, in the two major areas of belief and behavior. And your beliefs affect your behavior. And when you believe wrong things, you behave in a wrong way. It's inevitable. If you get the right faith, then your behavior gets right. But if you get the wrong faith, then your behavior goes wrong. And so uh, false teaching had come in. But was it a particular heresy? That's the argument of the scholars. And they've looked at it and said, was it one of these mystery religions? Was it a Gnostic faith that had come in? And they've never been able to reach a conclusion. Because when you make a list of the errors that Paul deals with in belief and behavior, they don't add up to any known sect or cult. Now, sometimes you can see straight away the false cult that had come in and got hold of them. But in Colossians, you cannot work it out. And you say, what was it that had got in? It certainly wasn't uh, Judaism that had got in. It wasn't one of the mystery religions. It wasn't astrology. And yet somehow it seems to be a mixture of the whole lot of them. And that's the thing that has puzzled scholars. A lot of it is what we call New Age today. But like New Age, New Age is not a particular cult. It's not even a movement. It's what I call a mood rather than a movement. And it's a kind of snowball that picks up all kinds of things, vegetarianism, feminism, Gaiaism, whatever. And, and New Age thinking kind of picks up things as it goes along, like a, a snowball picks up anything in its path. It's not a particular organization. It's a mood that people have got into. 
And I think that's the real reason why we can't identify the particular heresy at Colossae. It was a mood, or to put it more simply, it was a mixture. And the real problem at Colossae was one we're having to deal with all the time of bringing too much from outside into Christianity. So the problem is not so much heresy as syncretism. Now that's a word you need to learn. Syncretism is to mix faiths together and you finish up with a hodgepodge and it picks up anything and mixes it all in. It's not a particular cult or a heresy, it's just, it, it's just a bad mixture. And when you mix the Christian faith with bits from these other faiths and from your pagan background, you finish up with something that's not Christianity. <coughs> even though you may still call it that, you have lost something. And this is the real problem at Colossae, and it's a problem we are peculiarly wrestling with now here in the 20th century. And therefore the letter to Colossians has a, a very important message for us. It's a cool message, but we need cool heads today, we really do. We need warm hearts, but very cool heads to think carefully what's happening. All kinds of things are creeping in to the church today. Reflexology is now right inside the church and you get Christians practicing it and yoga is right inside the church. We've got to ask what's happening and what's the result of all this happening? And Colossians gives us a wonderful tool to analyze syncretism, the mixture of faiths and especially the pressure is on us today to mix Christianity with other religions, to have festivals of faith in which Buddhist, Hindu, Christian and Jew can all meet together. The Pope calls for united prayer in Assisi for world peace and all the religions come together. There was a festival of the forest in Canterbury Cathedral when all the religions came by different roads to the cathedral to pray for the trees. And a lot of it is tied up with the environment, believe me. And you'll find that the elemental powers of nature had somehow got mixed in with the Christian faith of the Colossians. Very, very relevant. I've begun there because I want you to see how relevant it is to right where we are. It's just what we've got to handle today. Syncretism. Some of the mixture, of course, was Jewish. And some Jewish things had been brought in. And some pagan things and some animistic things. And the whole thing was getting to be such a mixture that Christ was losing his preeminence. And that's the key to the whole letter. You see, the more you bring in all these other things, the more people want to talk about the good that reflexology has done for me, the good that yoga did for me, and all the rest, somehow they stop talking about what Christ has done for us. And in many of these mixed festivals of faith with different religions, it's Christ who disappears. See? It's the name of Jesus that is no longer prominent, preeminent. And so this letter puts great emph emphasis on the preeminence of Christ, that he may have the preeminence, that he may be the focus of all our attention. But when you start mixing Christianity with other faiths, and especially your background faiths, then Christ loses his place. He is no longer the focus of Christianity. Well, now let's look at the letter itself and begin to see what was happening. The problem was syncretism and it was turning Christianity into a religion. That is always the danger. Christianity for many people in this country is a religion. I call it churchianity. You know what I mean? England is officially Christian, but a lot of it is religious. And if there's one thing Christ does, he, he saves us from religion. Isn't that your testimony? When you come to Christ, you stop being religious. And yet the funny thing is all your neighbors will say, I hear you've gone religious. <laughs> well, that gives you a wonderful opening to say, no, I've finished with religion. I'm not religious anymore. I used to be, but I'm not now. Because it's, it's unbelievers in Christ who are religious. Even in their superstitions, they're religious. We have stopped being religious, for Christianity is not a religion. 
And to combat syncretism, the only thing you can defend Christianity with is the simplicity of Christ. And essentially, Christianity is simple. It is not a religion. It is a relationship with Christ. It's as simple as that. And that's the one thing that stops this syncretism. Just saying, no, I'm not religious, so I don't join in congresses of religion. I believe in Jesus. Simple. So, these are the two themes. Syncretism that makes a religion of Christianity, and the simplicity of centering everything on a relationship to Christ. And that's a summary of the letter. Now let's look at what was happening in the syncretism that was taking place at Colossae. It may not be the same as syncretism today, but uh, we can learn from this. The effect of mixing other faiths with the Christian faith is to reduce belief. And in two particular ways at Colossae, belief had been reduced. First, they had lost a sense of the imminence of God. Now, let's just explain these big words. Christians believe that God is both transcendent and imminent. He is both far above us and far from us and near to us. It's a paradox. And if you forget either side of the paradox, you lose the Christian belief in God. God is both greater than the universe and nearer than breathing. That's what we mean by transcendence and imminence. Now, the mixture of faith at Colossae, they had lost the sense of God being near them, and God was now far away from them. God was a distant being. Yes, he was there, but he was almost beyond reach. And they filled in the gap between with all kinds of beliefs in angels and spirits and other things. And when God is not near to you, you have to fill the gap with something else. And those things or beings that you fill in the gap with become nearer to you than God. Do you see? And that was the first thing that was happening at Colossae. Their sense of God being with them was getting lost. And God was somehow receding. He was still real, they believed in him, but he was somehow far away. And you know, sometimes we build church buildings that gives the impression that God's an awful long way away from us, with very high ceilings, you know, and soaring archways that when you go in, you sort of feel like a church mouse, don't you? And you whisper, and God seems so far away. On the other hand, I would think in many fellowships today, God has become so near to us that we've almost got too pally with him. Do you know what I mean? And got too friendly and forgotten that he is an awesome God. And we've lost the reverence. It's a balance that we need here. And if you forget the transcendence of God, how great he is and how far above us, you will lose your reverence. But if you forget the imminence of God, you will lose your sense of his being with us. So we need to hold on to both. They were losing the imminence of God. And God was now too high in their estimation. At the same time, Christ was too low in their thinking, and they had lost the preeminence of Christ. And somehow he was being placed alongside other beings. And in fact, the Jehovah's Witness error had crept in, in which they were thinking of Jesus as a creature rather than a creator, as on the creature side of reality rather than the creator side of the reality, exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, that Jesus is not quite God, that he's somewhere in between us and God. Do you see? Now that means God has got too high and Jesus has got too low, and the faith is getting distorted. Now that's on the belief side, and Paul is going to really deal with those two things and he does most effectively. The behavior side, you not only had a reduced belief, but the result was a regulated behavior. And he mentions uh, two things that had crept in that were non-Christian, essentially, but are right inside the Christian life now. 
The first he mentions was the observance of a calendar. They now observed annual festivals and monthly festivals and weekly festivals. There is no trace in the New Testament whatever of Christian observance of a calendar. Now, you see, this is where it comes home because the calendar the church observes is largely pagan and it has been mixed into Christianity. I'll come back to that in a moment. The outstanding example of syncretism in Britain is Christmas. And yet you tell Christians that they should not observe Christmas and you'll, I know because I've done it. <laughs> and uh, I could show you some of the correspondence I've had because I've, I've stood for getting Christ out of Christmas. And you wouldn't believe how unpopular that is. Show me one verse in the New Testament that says Christians should do anything special at Christmas. It's not there, but syncretism has put that pagan midwinter festival right in to the Christian calendar. And where would we be without Christmas and Christmas Eve communion? <laughs> you see? It is sheer paganism that has got mixed in. And Christ is reduced to a baby in a manger, which he is not. All right, I'm getting warmed up because... <laughs> Can you see? You see, this is Colossians, and we read that so objectively. So, oh, those dreadful Colossians are letting all those pagan things get mixed up. We do exactly the same, and when we're accused of doing it, hey, no, no, Christmas is the best time of the year in our church. Observance of a calendar. Christianity is not the observance of calendars. It is not the observance of Christmas and Easter. Where in the New Testament are you told to have a special Easter? Nowhere. Christ is risen every day. And even Sunday observance is never commanded of Gentile observers in the New Testament. Yet we all want to keep Sunday special. There's not a basis in the New Testament for doing that. We are free to do that if we want to. And we're free to count every day the Lord's Day if we want to. We're free. We're not under any law about Sunday or any law about Christmas or any law about Easter, but we do it and we assume it's Christian. We're Colossians. Anyway, observance of calendar, Paul says, have nothing to do with annual or monthly festivals or weekly Sabbaths. These do not belong to the age to come. Well, you're willing to obey that word? The other thing, again, this came in from the Greeks again, abstinence of the body, that there is virtue in denying your body its appetites. And therefore they were forbidding people to marry now. And celibacy was now the thing. And they had a list of taboos. Don't touch this, don't taste, taste that. And Paul was going to have to say, God has given us all things freely to enjoy. A Christian is free to fast and to feast. You're free. I remember being invited to a family father, mother, three children, a gorgeous meal, and the smell of it, my, I was drooling already, you know, like the Pavlovian dog, I was really ready for it. And the father said, would you give thanks? And I said, Lord, I'm ready for this and it's ready for me, thank you. <laughs> and I opened my eyes and the father and mother looked at me with horror, you know, thought this was a man of God we had for lunch. <laughs> but the kids loved me. And the children's faces said, if this is Christianity, we'll go for it. I'm not going to spoil a good meal with a long grace. That's sacrilege. <laughs> you see? And, uh, oh, I hope I haven't shocked you, have I? But you see, <laughs> Christianity is not a matter of giving up sweets in Lent. Giving up sweets in Lent is precisely putting these two things together. See? We'll come later to what Paul says Christians should be giving up. They should be giving up pride and anger and he's got a whole lot of things to give up and not just during Lent either, do you see? Problem is if you give up sweets in Lent, you put in your thumb and pull out a plum and say, what a good boy am I, you see? And then as soon as Lent's over or at least before Lent comes, you can fill up on pancakes. That's precisely what started Pancake Tuesday. And then after Lent is over, you see it in the Muslims, Ramadan. They don't touch food until sunset during Ramadan. Then they feast and get all indigestion and <laughs> become quite bad-tempered. 
You see, Christianity is not a matter of observing periods. It's a matter of giving up pride and anger every day. See? It's not a matter of doing things for this calendar period. It's a matter of living consistently in Christ or every day of your life. Every day is Christmas Day to the Christian. Every day is Easter Sunday to the real Christian. It's not something we observe. It's something we live in the whole time. Well, I'm getting all excited, but you see how their beliefs and their behaviors somehow were drifting, meandering away from Christ. So Paul says the answer to this is simplicity. Boil it down. I remember that conversation between Martin Luther when he was still a monk trying to save himself by praying to three saints every day, 21 different saints every week, flogging himself in the cell till he fell unconscious on the cell floor, trying to beat the sins out of him, and he tried everything. He went on pilgrimage, climbed the holy steps in Rome on his knees. He did everything, and then he gave it all up. And his superior general, his father superior, a man called Van Staupitz, said to him, Martin Luther, if you take away relics and pilgrimages and prayers to saints and all these devotional practices, what will you put in their place? And Martin Luther said, Christ. Man only needs Jesus Christ. That's how the Protestant Reformation began. He did away with all this and put Christ back in his place. The important thing is not whether you give up sweets and lent, but whether you are in Christ every day. Keep it simple. The simplicity that is in Christ. And he then focuses our attention on Christ in a wonderful way. He says two things about Christ. First, all the divine fullness you've got in Christ. It all dwelt in him bodily. As Charles Wesley put it, our God contracted to a span incomprehensibly made man. When you've got Jesus, you've got all of God. <laughs> you've got everything in God in Jesus. And therefore, we must remember Jesus was the creator of the universe. He was involved. Before he made chairs and tables, he made the trees from which he'd get the timber. Before he preached the Sermon on the Mount, he made the mountains so he'd have a pulpit. <laughs> Jesus was there at the creation. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. He's not only the creator of the universe, he's the conqueror of the powers. All the principalities and the powers in the universe are under Jesus' control now. All authority in heaven and earth is his. And the third thing he says, he's the controller of the church. He's head of the church. Church has only one head, not many. It has no human head. It has one divine head. The head of the church is Jesus. That headship is not delegated to anyone else. He is the creator of the universe, the conqueror of the powers. All those element and elemental powers of nature are all under Jesus' control. Why don't these marvelous nature films on TV give the glory to the Father God instead of Mother Nature and give the glory to Jesus? That's all Jesus doing. He made those creatures. He gave them their beauty and their marvelous powers. And the other side of it is our relationship to this Christ who has the preeminence in whom all the divine fullness dwells is a life lived focused on him. And that life has to be worked out in many practical areas. The first, it needs to be worked out in your own passions, giving up those wrong passions, not just for Lent, but every day, putting off those things that are not Christ-like. That's true Christian living. It's not denying yourself sweets in Lent. It's putting off the unchrist like passions that so easily come take over. It means charity in the church. It means forgiving one another as he has forgiven us. He's been amazingly patient with me. Then I must be patient with you. That's living in Christ. He's forgiven me. I must forgive you. Forgive me my sins, it was prayed this morning, as we forgive. You see, that's working it out. That's simplicity in Christ. And above all, harmony in the home. That's where it's to be worked out. The relationships between husbands and wives, 
between parents and children, between masters and slaves, all of which were in the home, of course. The slavery was in the home, the domestic. And not a very popular word here, submission is used. Submission of wives to husbands, of children to parents, and of slaves to masters. But also there are responsibilities on husbands and parents and masters to be sacrificial towards those who submit to them. And it's all there. So that this is the kind of thing, not the observance of a calendar, not turning up at church at Christmas and Easter, and not denying the body and trying to say, I'm doing without this, and what a good boy am I. What is really involved is the simplicity of seeing that Christ is everything you need, and everything in God is in Christ, and then letting that affect every part of life. What a message. See? So God isn't looking for people who will turn up in great numbers to a Christian festival. He's looking for those who will simply live in Christ all the time, in every part, and in every relationship. I think it's a beautiful message of Colossians, and my, do we need it today. Well, we need it for two reasons, and with this I close. The first is that I have to be honest and say that I believe all the way through the New Testament there is clear warning that we can lose our salvation. And it's here in Colossians very clearly. It's very clearly in many other letters, supremely in Matthew and Hebrews and Revelation, all of which state it very clearly. But here in Colossians, Paul says, if you continue in the faith you were given. Very important. And he warns them that if they give way to the unchristlike passions, they will forfeit their place in the kingdom of God. It's a solemn thought. If you don't continue with that simplicity in Christ and get involved in religion again, get involved in ritual and get involved in all this and think that's Christianity and somehow Christ loses place in your life, you are in danger. If you lose Christ, you lose everything. And there it is clearly stated, verse 23 of chapter 1, if you continue in your faith, all this is yours. We can't underline that too strongly. He says, because of these other passions, the wrath of God is coming, and I don't want it to come on you. He says you can be disqualified in chapter 2, disqualified for your inheritance. He says, I want you to be qualified. He says, these other things that have crept in have kidnapped you. It's a very strong word. Have kidnapped you and taken you away from Jesus. And that's what these things do when you mix Christianity with other things. They kidnap you and take you away from Jesus. So that's the negative side. It's a strong warning that you can lapse into religion having come to Christ. And if you do, you lose him, and with him you lose everything. The positive side is Christianity is Christ, so continue in him. That's why he says, the key verse is uh, verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2. He says, as you received Christ, so live in him. As you rooted him in him, be built up in him. As you were taught about him, be established in him. Now you see, it's not just enough to come to Christ. You need to be rooted and built up in him and established in him and continue in Christ all the way. The danger is that other things coming in can get you back into religion, even a religion called Christianity, which is not Christ, and then you lose everything. It was Jesus himself who said, I am the true vine. Abide in me. Stay in me. Branches that abide in me will be fruitful. Branches that don't abide in me will be cut off and burned. That's the real danger, why Paul was willing to write to a church he'd never been to, a church he didn't found, and yet a church that poison was getting into. And he was so concerned that they lose what they originally had in Christ that he wrote this lovely letter. 
It's a cool letter. It's a sobering letter, but it's a letter we all need to read.